You need two. Language. A. What is language? Last unit, it was mentioned that one of the cognitive fields of humans is what we call intellect. It was also said that some of the elements that constitute the world of a subject are concepts, which are precisely a product of the intellect. So, in order to explain what language is, in theory of knowledge, we need to understand what concepts are, how they are created, and how they are classified. It was mentioned that senses are stimulated by objects around the subject and pass the stimulation to the brain by means of the nervous system. At the brain, the electric waves are interpreted as images and they are formed. As this happens, the brain utilizes another of its capacities, which is pattern finding. That means comparing objects, finding similarities, finding differences, gathering the ones that share the similarities found by the brain in certain types of groups hierarchically ordered, and excluding those other objects that don't share the similar features. The criteria that signal similarities is infinite, and it ranges from a very blunt, all the path, to very fine ones. The groups resulting from the gathering of objects are named concepts, and the process of gathering them is named to abstract or to conceive. To abstract or to conceive is then to create mental universal sets of objects out of the particular ones. If the objects gathered conceptually are sensible or sensitizable, they are concepts in strict sense. If they gather non-sensible objects, they are called notions. Notions refer not to the sensitizable objects, but to the space-time and causal relations that the subject finds between the objects. Thus, notions do not exist anywhere except for the understanding and the mind of the subject. The opposite mental cognitive process, that means to signal a particular object as pertaining or not to a certain universal set, is called to judge, and its result is called a judgment. Both processes of conceiving and judging happen in the mind of the subject, thus they have little to do with the realm of things in a necessary way, but they can often be related with them contingently. Humans frequently conceive and judge things astray. Since to conceive and to judge happen internally, humans, thanks again to another one of their intellectual capacities, named capacity to symbolize, create a system of representations of objects of the mind that could be graspable for other subjects outside of themselves. The representative tools are called symbols, signs, or signals while the represented objects are called symbolized or signaled objects. Symbols or signals have to be external and sensitizable for everyone to have a chance of seizing what the others have conceived or judged. Given the fact that we have at least five senses and that symbols have to be sensitizable, symbols have to affect at least one of our senses to give us the mentioned chance. Although there are symbol systems for every sense, we are more used to capture two of them, visual and auditive symbols. Each system of symbol is what we more commonly call language. B. The relation between language, the world, understanding, and creating truths. Given that language is a system of symbols, that symbols are representations of concepts, and that concepts are the mental universal sets of particular objects, it must be understood that the ground for language are concepts and not the other way around. In a vast number of discourses that display themselves in the political arena, it is affirmed that language determines concepts, just as concepts determine conducts. Thus, 
if languages change, concepts will be as well, and thus conducts. That is simply unsustainable. Thus, to defend such a position is undesirable because it signifies defending an error with all the consequences that come out from that. Think about the following. Concepts are prelinguistic. The symbol will never appear before the symbolized. Behavior, conducts, and decision making are not related to concepts, let alone language, but to trial, error, and consequences. We all have been taught what's desirable and what's not desirable in our community or society, but that mere teaching process does not suffice. Learning to follow directions and conduct maxims is a result of doing it wrong, analyzing the results of our actions, and finding them desirable or undesirable for us. In society, many of the results change along intersubjective relations because each subject has unique personal features, experiences, desires, feelings and concepts. That is why things that were helpful or unhelpful on one occasion may be the exact opposite in another. The latter does not mean that there are no valid universal moral principles, but that they are represented in many different manners, while behavior does not necessarily follow the moral maxims just for knowing their enunciation. Ethical coherence is a matter of practice, just as any other human activity. However, there is a relation between punishments and rewards and language. Since we were little children, the use of language has found either praises or preaches by other subjects. Humans have a tendency to feel pleasure every time they confirm their judgments of the world, and the most immediate confirmation comes from the corroboration granted by other subjects because it does not require the long, hard, and expensive scientific method. Ah, uh, yes! Coming from another person suffices for the subject to be convinced of the rightness of his judgments, while a no is easily round down and discarded by merely hanging on to our convictions even if that flirts with being stubborn. If persons accept and repeat the words of a subject as if they were in community with his judgments, people are constantly rewarded by that subject, while when they do not, they are constantly punished even if it is just by means of prolonging a bitter or acid discussion. Be the way it may, by agreement, conviction, or forcefully, a discourse that is repeated by members of a community will end up directly or indirectly establishing the norms of that group. From simple acts of courtesy, affinity in groups of friends or clubs, and more transcendentally, in legal matters. Once a speech has reached the level of forcefully implementation by means of legal tools, that society has reached the level of a tyranny, because the power of the state is irresistible by definition. However, due to the arrival of social media, we have rapidly learned that there are some other ways to impose a speech upon society, for their punishments have become the modern form of the scarlet letter. That which is now called cultural battle or cultural war is a war of speeches or narratives as all sides in conflict like to call their judgments of the world. Each one of the sides is trying to convince people of the goodness and evilness of the positions in conflict and use language in a very Machiavellian way. The more people that absorbs their language and repeats them, the more control they have over the means of punishment and reward thus over the conducts of the others, thus over the destiny of persons and communities. This cannot become anything else but chaotic intersubjectivity. What we see in social media nowadays and how that it's taken to the streets might be just the tip of the iceberg of what's yet to come in terms of social chaos.